What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will cover everything from the arms and armament, strengths and weaknesses, history and impact on the galaxy, pulling from all these resources to understand the Arkodan's class light cruiser. The capital ships of the Grand Army of the Republic had been in production for years before the Battle of Geonosis, and while there is no official start date, it is only the Acclimator class that was available in huge numbers when the Clone Wars began. But the Venator and Arkodans would be flying away from the Kuat Drive Yard's assembly lines within weeks, and would quickly be seen in every theater of the war. At a cost of 4 million credits, it was only 7% the cost of the Venator, and about half a Pelta and 1 million more than the Consular. At a length of 325 meters, a 135 meter width, and a height of 56 meters, it was more than a quarter of the length of a Venator, one third the width of an Acclimator, and about as tall as 5.5 ATTEs. Its max acceleration of 1800 Gs makes it more than half the acceleration of the Venator, powered by the same trio of engines that are in the Consular class, giving it a top atmospheric speed of 750 km per hour, making it relatively slow compared to just about all other capital ships. And this difference in colors from the engine has no official explanation, but is believed to be from a different fuel source. Much like how the different types of Tabana and blasters can be blue or yellow, some ships of the same exact class are shown with different orange or blue engine glows. And while its Class II hyperdrive rating puts it about average in general, keep in mind that this time of the galaxy had some of the fastest capital ships in history, with the Venator having a Class I, something usually only seen in Starfighters, and the Acclimator had an incredible Class 0 0.6, which put it in the League of the Slave I in Millennium Falcon. Its shielding was generated by projecting layers of deflector shields like an onion, but they hoped that the outermost layer could be refreshed by the time it took you to work through all these layers. The hull itself is likely built in the same style as other Republic capital ships, with layers of overlapping durasteel plating. But there is a quote from Grievous mentioning that it is well armed with a thick hull, though whether it's significantly more thick than the others is unclear. And the arms he's mentioning came in the form of four turret-mounted twin light turbo laser batteries, four heavy port and starboard quad laser cannon batteries, and four variable munition launchers for torpedoes and missiles. Though some would pull off the ventral laser cannon trick seen in the Venator, something General Skywalker came up with and first implemented, which used the laser from the SPHA to melt through ground positions and enemy ships. The unique feature is that all these weapon batteries could be retracted into the hull for a more streamlined profile during atmospheric flight, but I would imagine they would also do this so that they could keep them from being damaged, when passing through toxic smog or highly electrically charged alien atmospheres, or through the ice and rocks of planetary rings and asteroid belts why risk damaging the weaponry when you can safely put it behind the durable armor plating? Inside, the bridge looks to be about 10 meters deep and 20 meters wide, with panels providing all sorts of battlefront data, and comm stations to reach allies in nearby systems, even all the way back to Coruscant with hyperwave transmitter technology. And though it looks like this door is connected to an elevator, it seems like it's just a hallway, which must connect to the elevators towards the rear. And the pilot's cockpit itself actually looks like something you would see in a freighter, with these two captain chairs in this cove. While it hosted a total crew of 100, including the enlisted troops inside, but could also accommodate 100 passengers, and had a cargo capacity of 1,200 tons, equal to the weight of 1,472 dewbacks. This weight was usually used for rations, not canned do meat, and it would be used during blockade runs to help resupply Republic bases or help out local populations. And its complement of starfighters from the Clone Wars era is oddly unknown. But since we know that the Imperial Era 1 had three TIE fighters, two Lambda-class shuttles, and various speeders, it must have had space for a combo of smaller fighters like the Delta and Eta, or it could be used for just a few ARC-170s, maybe some new class shuttles, and perhaps even LA-AT gunships. Now it is called a light cruiser, but it is classified as an escort class like the Pelta and Charger, not a true cruiser like the Venator and Dreadnought. During the rescue of Eeth Koth and the Space Battle of Seleucami, Kenobi would use his Arquidans, the Surrogator, to lead an assault with a trio of Charger C-70s in order to distract Grievous's flotilla while Skywalker's team boarded the flagship. While he taunted Grievous, the rest of the Republic fleet popped out of hyperspace. The enemy ships are faster and more maneuverable. I suggest caution. As the Chargers zipped around the CIS capital ships, Kenobi inched the Arquidans closer, prompting Grievous to think that he had outmaneuvered the Jedi. Give me a tractor beam lock on Kenobi's ship and prepare a boarding party. Kenobi tells Cody that this is to make sure Grievous was focused on them. And moments later, the complex series of tractor beam projectors that lined the requisite class were able to force a docking, and the space battle was about to turn into an intense close quarters firefight. The 212th boys were in position to ambush the boarding party, but the agility of the commando droids overwhelmed them, and forced a reunion with these Clone Wars rivals. Sabres clashed and the fight spills into the bridge, where the blades would slice through crucial computer systems. 
and after Grievous tactically withdrew from the fight, the Requisite opened up and destroyed the Arquitan's engines. Eventually, the docking tube would break off as well, and the ship was experiencing a chain reaction of failures that would take the lives of these brave clones. The reactor's been breached! I can't lock it down! But they would get their revenge from the grave as enormous chunks of fiery debris crashed into the CIS ship and hit the C9979 Grievous was using as an escape ship, forcing a crash landing and near capture down on the surface. The Arquidans would prove crucial elements to all major fleets, using their smaller size and powerful weaponry to position themselves in perfect spots to disable and destroy much larger CIS capital ships. Being seen during the defense of Camino, the Battle of Sullust, Admiral Barton Coburn used them expertly as a mobile attack platform so that Wolfpack could use their jetpacks to free the Togruta in the slave processing facility on Kadavo. Later they can be seen during the Battle of Ringovinda, and even after the war they would serve the Imperial Navy, spreading peace by destroying Separatist holdouts, pirate startups, and using that laser attachment to slice through rowdy civilian centers whenever they spoke out against their leader. This was the story on Imperial-held Umbara, the location of one of the most powerful and earliest rebel cells led by Night Swan, using Republic weapons and vehicles alongside hacked battle droids and vulture droid starfighters. During the pacification of Umbara, a young Thrawn might have been killed if it wasn't for the expert application of the Arquidans, the Thunder Wasp, which was able to destroy the vulture droid transmission station and force these rebels to retreat. As Night Swan continued his campaign against the New Order, Thrawn would come to truly respect this rebel, when even he was surprised by the unorthodox defense of an island outpost. The rebel dropped his shield cycle to disable all three Arquidans with a perfectly hidden ion cannon, forcing the imps to hold off, and the shield generator proved so powerful that it was impervious to the Arquidans' bombardments. But Thrawn's quick thinking to direct all the cannons to sweep towards the island caused an enormous wave, which flooded the outpost and short-circuited the generator. A battle that showed everyone the genius of both Night Swan and Thrawn. The Chiss would finally get the upper hand once he had his flagship the Chimera, an Imperial One-class Star Destroyer that Night Swan had calculated his feet could overcome with this perfectly launched ambush. Thrawn had his three Arquidans, filled their center and sides with repair barges to make it look like the Chimera was protecting them. But once the Rebel fleet was between the Imperial ships, the barges exploded to release dozens of TIE fighters that quickly overwhelmed the Rebel forces and secured an Imperial victory. A couple years prior to 4 BBY, the Imperial Navy recalled every Arquidan still in service across the entire galaxy, bringing them the Kuat Drive Yards to undergo a refit unlike any other Republic ship. The refits would cost 1 million credits, changing the armament to 4 turret-mounted twin light turbo laser batteries, 8 quad laser batteries, and adding a medium tractor beam projector while keeping the four launch tubes. It would lose 95 meters in overall length, and they put a superstructure over the engine array, while the bridge too was also altered in its shape. The side-mounted turbolaser batteries were swapped out for eight escape pods, and towards the bow there was this lateral entry for jump troopers. These were dubbed the Arquidans class command cruisers, and they used the space in between the prongs to perfectly dock the Sentinel class shuttle and Lambda. Late into the Imperial era, the rebel groups were learning sneaky ways to use the imp strength against them, with one famous incident being seen during the attempted capture of the Shadowcaster, where Sabine and Anyo would let a shuttle filled with explosives be caught by the tractor beam and pulled near the command ship. Once it exploded, it destroyed the projector and forced the Imperial crew to focus on managing the damage and allowed the rebels to escape in their main ship. While one of the lowest uses of this proud Republic craft came in the form of the Akresker Jail, as Dr. Aphra described it, it was, quote, 8,000 tons of wrecked warships held together with an attractor node, hauled about by a cruiser on string. The Empire used these holes of ships like prison wings, and they would house what was called the Convict Army, or a Kresker Penal Legion, which were all kept in line via implants and hub droids. If you got more than 10 meters away from the droid, your implant would explode. If you chose not to fight, your implant would explode. And so you had to rush the enemy position as a literal crime wave, with heavy losses and no chance at you joining up with the enemy that you were sent to slaughter. But one day, without warning, the crew quickly abandoned ship, jettisoning away on those escape pods, and the drifting Arquidans smashed into the prisons. Many were killed while others were stranded, and when the Empire came back around to set it on a collision course with a planet to liquidate this entire project, Vader intervened with his Executor Imperial Star Destroyer, holding it still with his tractor beams so he could hunt down his old ally. But when he couldn't capture Dr. Aphra, he let the prison smash into the world, killing all the prisoners and any unlucky life caught down below. After the Battle of Endor, the Empire was scrambling to maintain order, and an attack on Fondor shipyards would create a major shortage of these cruisers from then on out. 
but at least one was seen on Vardos and Takodana as late as 5 ABY. And with the ones still remaining, or at least those sections still available, the Imperial Remnant forces under Moff Gideon would create another heavily modified variant of the Arquidans, called the Class 546 Cruiser, using these same three engines, but adding these four secondary sublight engines, giving it a much greater top speed and acceleration, making it an even better fast attack cruiser, like a mix of Arquidans and Acclimator. They filled up more of this gap, while hollowing out the interior for enormous hangar sections, allowing the nimble TIE fighters to exit via port, starboard, or be accelerated via the launch tube at the center, right in between those prongs, creating a unique set of challenges for anything it came across, and was perfectly adapted to this time of a fractured galaxy, where TIE fighters might still be plentiful to come by, and responding to New Republic scouts and local warlords was best done with quick, overwhelming force. So that's it for the Arquidans class light cruiser. As for behind the scenes facts, we can assume that this is one of Dave Filoni's favorite ships, inspired by concept art from episode three, because everything he touches seems to get a variant. Being introduced in the Clone Wars, we get the command cruiser and rebels, and the Mandalorian gets the 546. A lot of these stats come from the Dawn of the Rebellion roleplay sourcebook, Ultimate Star Wars, and actually the Star Wars build the Millennium Falcon, which is packed full of stats on a ton of other ships as well. If you like this video, you'll be sure to like these videos. Likes, comments, and shares are the best way to help me out. Subscribe if you want to see more, check out the membership, but most important of all, remember, if you want to see more variants, just make sure Filoni gets more shows. And the Force will be with you. Always.